SCP-6003, The Beacon. Working for the Foundation certainly does not seem like a great gig, even in the best of conditions. From researchers working with unpredictable and deadly phenomena, to MTF agents sent in to contain a rampaging monster, to your everyday containment breaches, your average Foundation personnel has to deal with a tremendous amount of stress. One especially dangerous and stressful aspect of the career, though, is when personnel are sent in to investigate a completely unknown anomaly, which is what we'll be looking at today. Combine that with an extended period of isolation, long working hours, and little to no backup, and you've got quite the recipe for disaster. SCP-6003 is an island located in the Pacific Ocean, or more accurately, located inside of an extra-dimensional pocket of space in the Pacific Ocean. This island is inaccessible to those without knowledge of it and or its coordinates, but those that travel via sea with the intention of reaching the island will inevitably do so, even without navigational expertise or even knowing exactly where it is. After traveling for a duration ranging between 45 minutes and 8 hours, individuals report their navigational instruments ceasing to function, and they enter into a blanket of fog before emerging into the pocket dimension, 10 kilometers from the island's shoreline. This occurs regardless of how far the individuals were from the coordinates when they departed, and does not apply to those traveling via airplane. Located on the island are a number of plants, a variety of which are unique to 6003, and a 50 meter tall, smooth wooden pillar in the center of the island taking the form of an early 1940s lighthouse. It appears to be one solid piece of hollowed wood, with the top section carved into a lantern pane, although it is not an actually operating lighthouse. They have yet to find an entrance into the structure, and it has proved to be resistant to any force applied so far. The base of the structure extends at least 15 meters into the earth, and much of the soil surrounding it swells like tree roots. The Foundation have tried to do some radiocarbon dating of the structure, but the results have been rather inconclusive, ranging from 12,000 BCE to three years prior to discovery. There are other things present on the island, however. Signs of previous habitation, including elaborate ruins, written records, sophisticated technology, and personal effects. The Foundation's best guess is that whoever lived here inhabited it upwards of 2,000 years ago, but they haven't found any outside corroborating information about who this civilization was. There doesn't seem to be any evidence of trade records in the writings found, and yet a number of things the Foundation found, including tools, statues, and lodgings, are comprised of materials not naturally occurring on the island. So far, they have yet to find any physical remains. The island first came to the attention of the rest of the Foundation after the passing of 056 in 1968. Among their possessions left for further research was a heavily water-damaged manuscript with an unknown origin. Only part of the manuscript remained, reading, And he said unto Lothos, Traverse the seas, the waters of the world, though come not to that place. Craft from night and bounded hate, a paradise lived alone his meager kingdom ever still beneath the wooded throne, where harrowed silence permeates, no reverence maintained. A quiet corner undisturbed, the sleeping giant remains. Vantala took heed of her master's warning and wept. It seems that 056 was able to decipher the coordinates of the island from that passage by using numerology, which were also entrusted to the rest of the Foundation. The initial team sent to check out the coordinates consisted of members of MTF Zeta-67, Anchors Away, and three researchers, Thomas Swain, 
Emily Clark, and Rosa Hamm. Swain, the head of the research team, kept a journal of the encounter, and as usual, I'll read the excerpts verbatim. When the Foundation sends us out, they usually want something in particular. A captured anomaly, a person of interest, something. Getting sent out for preliminary exploration, on the other hand, makes you feel like a ball in a pachinko machine. They're just dropping us and seeing where we land. This time around, we didn't get any concrete instructions other than doing a clean sweep of the place and making sure that everyone gets out in one piece. There was always a chance that those would be at odds with each other, but the higher-ups never were revered for their communication skills. Past the initial shore, there's a ring of craggy, silt-laden plains. A brief trek through the sediment, and we came into a grassy, lush valley. The change in scenery was jarring, but considering the circumstances of our arrival, it wasn't unbelievable, just nonsensical. Then there were the ruins, lots of them, laid throughout the valley clearing as far as the eye could see. Each building was one long room assorted into horizontal sections. Well, diagonal columns. The thing was that each room was slightly more elevated than the one before it, like a massive, circular staircase. You know the Colosseum? Picture that, but gray falling apart due to hundreds of years of natural decay, and a thousand times bigger. Footage from Swain's body camera shows him walking the perimeter of the island amidst the ruins, coming across a particularly wide ruin composed of what appears to be sandstone. On the right side of the entrance is a featureless stone pillar extending to shoulder height, its top significantly more worn than the surrounding structures, as if it had been touched by many hands. Swain enters the ruin, remarking to himself on the rows of what seem to be stone benches that get progressively taller. His best guess is that this was some sort of communal space, but he's interrupted when he stumbles over a broken stone cylinder, only two inches tall. He crouches down to inspect it, but then spots a second stone cylinder between two benches, broken at one end and with a prism embedded into the other end. He grabs it and places it on the broken base on the ground, holding it with one hand while shining his flashlight through the prism. He suspects that this was a primitive light source, as the prism would light up the entire room if some sunlight hit it. He places the cylinder down, and heads to the back wall of the ruin, where he finds six haphazardly carved pillars. The first five have a wooden box on top of them, but the last one is coated in a thick, stone-like substance, which is concealing any box present on it, if there is one. Swain doesn't know what to think of all this, as everything is either too ancient or in complete shambles, but he heads over and opens the first box. A current of dust shoots out from it, but inside he finds a large stone with a crude painting drawn on it. The painting is too damaged to make out exactly what it is, but Swain takes the time to photograph the area before turning back towards the entrance of the ruin. He sees the lighthouse in the distance, and he stops to rest on the nearest stone bench. His body camera continues to face the entrance, but he's otherwise motionless for several minutes, occasionally mumbling to himself. Eventually, Emily contacts him on his radio to inform him that she and Rosa finished encircling the ruins. Swain didn't even hear her, though, and asks her to repeat the message. She says that they're going to try to see what's in the middle, and Swain tells her that he'll start making his way over there. We're given another journal excerpt. The outermost rooms had what may have once been 40 centimeters or so of steps, while the innermost ones were stone roofs poking out of the dirt. The low-lane buildings we could access had stairs leading down, so it's clear that they were supposed to be at least partially below ground. 
Details that would give us a clue as to what happened to the people who once lived here had broken down into nothing useful. If whoever lived here had doors, they had all disappeared by the time we arrived. What's more, the plants had moved in while they were gone. The grass was halfway up our boots, and Rosa almost tripped over some of the vines. Twice. The clovers were relatively tame. The front of each ruin always had a gap where a door might have been, with no openings anywhere except, occasionally, the back. Eventually, Rosa pointed out that the houses near the back of each segment were wider than the ones in the front. They weren't in a perfect grid. They were all angled slightly so that the sections pointed towards a single area. We'd only looked at a few buildings, and anything beyond that had been hiding in the fog, so we decided to walk around and figure out how wide the fan of ruins was. M went to the back of one building, Rosa went to the end of another, and they were planning to walk along by the outermost ruins in opposite directions until they reached opposite ends. Instead, they met on the other side. Since the ruins formed a giant ring, we decided to see what was in the middle. The fog was too thick for our flashlights to be worth a damn, so they had to get close to figure out what was there. They didn't have to finish walking to realize it was a lighthouse. A towering monolith jutting into the sky like the base of a great tree. It dwarfed the surrounding ruins, yet none of us noticed the structure until we approached the island center. Now it was impossible to miss. The tower was crafted from some type of wood. None of us, nor our equipment, could figure out what kind. It was gray, incredibly smooth at first glance, but the fine details revealed twists and curves in the surface, as if they were sculpted by expert hands. It was as breathtaking as it was terrifying. No power source, no entrance, but nonetheless the giant stood, an undeniable testament that something had been here before us. To think that we failed to notice something that commanded such a presence carried another unsettling implication. A few days later, the excavation site established in the innermost circle of ruins located a previously unnoticed passageway behind a large circular sculpture that hung on a wall. The passageway led to an ornate chamber decorated with intricate patterns and complex tapestries. Beyond this was a larger room with a similar design, where six rectangular stone boxes were situated. Each of these boxes held painted stone pieces, just like Swain found, but the images on these ones could be discerned. The image on the first stone depicts a person coated in heavy black furs, possibly a humanoid primate, standing on an empty patch of land with their arms outstretched. In front of them, a tree, highlighted by a yellow flash of light, can be seen contorting and changing its shape. The second stone shows two long ships making port at the northern edge of an island, at the center of which is the lighthouse structure, although its lantern appears to be operational. Positioned near the structure is a skeleton, presumably belonging to the figure from the first stone. The third stone shows a human figure, drawn with golden paint, most likely the tribe's leader or a figure of social importance, standing in front of the lighthouse with their arms outstretched. A beam of light is pointed at them. The fourth shows the lighthouse surrounded by trees, animals, overgrown grass, and food. Members of the tribe are kneeling to it, and the leader is shown standing in front of it with a grey crown on their head. The fifth stone shows the ruins that now surround the lighthouse along with the leader praying to the lighthouse and the rest of the tribe doing various tasks such as farming, conversing, or dancing. The back of this stone contains another image, of the tribe surrounding the lighthouse and their faces are weeping, solemn, or distressed. The leader can be seen either in front of or embedded into the structure, with beams of light shining out from them. 
there is also substantially more overgrowth in the background. The sixth box is inaccessible, however, just like the other one found, coated in an impenetrable gray material. We're then given an interview between Swain and Rosa, as Rosa requested for a transfer off of the project. The two discuss the Grand Canyon, as Rosa says that it's an example of how time lays on something, wearing down the world and carving through land, buildings, and people. The lighthouse, on the other hand, is utterly smooth, as it hasn't been touched by time or anything else. And it doesn't have any actual roots, as that would imply some sort of change and interaction with the rest of the landscape. Swain says that it's an anomaly, and it's just made of exceptionally strong wood, but Rosa isn't convinced. She says that living things age and dead things decay, but this thing does neither. It might as well not exist. Swain wants to conduct more research, but she's not interested, saying that there's nothing else to research on a small society that lived on an island that's nowhere next to a pillar of nothing before disappearing without a trace. She doesn't want to end up wherever the hell they went. Swain tries to convince her that this place is ancient, and they need to look into every corner before they make any assumptions, but she feels that something is wrong here and she doesn't know why he's going to such lengths to ignore her. Swain, however, says that she's not eligible for a transfer, despite her saying that she was only here to conduct preliminary exploration, and she's just trying to keep everyone alive. To her disbelief, though, he says that he can't approve her transfer unless she can prove that she's at some sort of elevated risk. She says that, he looked at the lighthouse and looked at those rocks and asks him what he saw. He responds that he saw people, people who obsessed over something they couldn't understand. Following a discussion with the rest of the staff, however, Rosa's request for transfer was ultimately approved, but so far she's the only one to make the request. A month after the initial discovery, a secure facility was established five kilometers off the coast of the island, labeled as Site Null. Sixteen personnel, sourced from the initial exploration team and the Foundation's archaeology department, were allocated to the site, led by Swain, with Emily Clark heading up the research department. The primary directive of the site is to function in conjunction with archaeological operations conducted on the island, with six excavation sites established so far. Over the course of the following week and a half, the staff reported a number of anomalous events occurring on the island and at the site itself. Numerous seagulls were seen circling above the site, and they are described as vulture-like, despite there being no recorded deviance from normal seagulls. It's unclear how they made it to this extra-dimensional pocket. A rogue wave formed unusually close to land, colliding with the site and injuring three personnel. More anomalously, water faucets at the site have repeatedly dispensed human blood, with chemical analysis indicating that the blood had been heavily diluted with seawater. Multiple radio frequencies that personnel were using were simultaneously disrupted, with reports of multiple voices being heard conversing in an unknown language. Plant growth in the ruins on the island anomalously accelerated, leading to the entrapment of two excavating personnel for several hours before being recovered. The fog density near the shoreline greatly increased, forcing personnel to exercise extreme caution when moving in or out. The site intercepted transmissions consisting of heavy breathing and a wet, shifting noise on a nightly basis, determined to be coming from the island. A team surveying the mountains on the island reported seeing a massive decaying tree lined with human eyes, which collapsed to the ground with a loud cry before disappearing. 
Two personnel that were fishing off of the site's dock reeled in a sealed wicker basket with several holes punched into its top half. When it was opened, several cloths and a small piece of bark engraved with an unknown symbol were found inside. Underground personnel at one of the excavation sites report hearing jovial sounds coming from above them and seeing dancing silhouettes flicker on the walls as if cast by a flame. The sounds were described as fleeting, and recalling the experience causes them emotional distress, often to the point of tears. The captain of the MTF refused to emerge from her quarters for three days, citing a claim that the lighthouse was watching and judging her. On the fourth day, she suffered short-term memory loss and could not recall the events of the past week, forcing her to be relieved of her duty. An archaeological team of four was seen standing in front of the lighthouse for eight hours straight, each individual situated in one of the cardinal directions around the pillar. When questioned, none of them viewed their actions as abnormal. A passing vessel was seen on the horizon, described as a long ship made from black, curved wood, with its bow holding up a large figurehead of what appeared to be the open-mouthed head of an ape, with eyes replaced with stones. The vessel passed within ten minutes, undetected by the site's radar. Personnel continued to report feelings of constantly being observed at the site and on the island, and Emily Clark becomes overcome with a fit of mania, fully convinced she is suffering an eternal punishment in the afterlife. She repeatedly cried out that vines were constraining her and pulling her into the ground. After several hours, she regained her composure, but noted distress has been observed in her demeanor since. Several personnel stationed on the island reported seeing holes in the ground, with large human eyes embedded in them, described as crying. Another transmission was intercepted, determined to be coming from the island, consisting of screaming. Personnel testing the chemical composition of the lighthouse experienced minor ground tremors, localized to the area immediately surrounding the pillar. All of them reported the sensation of hands grabbing onto their lower bodies and pulling. One of the site personnel collapsed in the field, and after a prolonged struggle with medical attention, during which he claimed his body was being pierced in multiple locations, he expired. An autopsy revealed that his nervous system had been replaced with fibrous tree roots. Finally, the island's anomalous formation of heavy fog is disrupted for the first time as a storm takes the island which has yet to subside, relegating all activity to the offshore site. In other words, it's a pretty weird island. During all of this, Swain spent most of his time focused on studying the lighthouse. After the formation of the storm, he goes back to the island again, this time joined by Joseph Legu, an expert on anomalous ruins and structures. The lighthouse seems to be made out of petrified wood, anomalously tough, and Legu says that he's heard that they petrify the shelves in the Wanderer's Library, but those shelves have color, not the uniform gray of this lighthouse. He doesn't think this came from the Wanderer's Library, and it's possible that whoever lived here built it. Swain hasn't found any evidence to believe that rather that they built the other structures around it, but Legu thinks it's possible that their leader summoned it somehow. Swain tells him that the paintings and carvings they've found seem to indicate that they praised this lighthouse, almost as if they were brought here because of it, or at least something relating to it. Legu says that he'll be doing some more research on it, and Swain remarks that it really makes you feel small, like you agrees, although he didn't really think about it until Swain mentioned it. Swain thinks that it was meant for something or someone, and wonders if they ever saw it. 
A faint rumbling is then heard as the fog above the two is illuminated by a blinding white light, which slowly begins to spin. Swain just stares at the light, but Legu approaches the base of the lighthouse, calling Swain over. The grass surrounding the lighthouse begins to fade in color, slowly turning from a vivid green into a muted gray. When he reaches for the grass to take a sample, however, it crumbles into ash. Since the event, the lantern in the lighthouse has remained constantly active, and over the next five days, the plant life in the area continued to lose color at a rate of around half a meter per hour. This rate slowly accelerated over the course of another week at a constant rate, and Legu found that the grass was being destroyed on a molecular level. Its cells were still intact, but they were in stasis and inert. Containment efforts began immediately after this discovery. They initially tried to ignite the affected plant life through controlled burns to try and limit the spread, but the effect continued accelerating through the burned plant life. They then removed all personnel from the island, thinking that they might be influencing things, but the effect continued to spread through the island, covering the ruins and the foundation outposts. Finally, they decided to not mess around anymore and just nuke the lighthouse, which seems like a rather drastic measure for the foundation. This proposal was denied by Swain, though. Fortunately, the effect stopped at the edges of the island, allowing the Foundation to continue researching what exactly caused it. The MTF team was sent into the island afterwards, remotely observed by Swain, to see what they could find and assess any potential damage, outfitted with standard hazardous environment equipment. They step through the material that was once grass, remarking that it feels like walking in snow. Through the fog, they can see the light from the lighthouse spinning in the distance, and they head to the main building in the ruins in order to reach a section that they couldn't access previously. One of the team touches the outer wall of a building which causes it to flake off, and they ask Swain if there's risk of any structural collapse. Swain just tells them not to lean on anything and to proceed in. One of them peels off a layer of the cobblestone flooring, remarking that it feels like dry sand or chalk. All of the members then pause and cup their hands over their ears, straining to hear something over the rain. Afterwards, they discuss what they heard, although none of them knows what it was, and Swain didn't hear anything from the site. They say it was like stone scraping on stone, or nails on a chalkboard. They continue on through the main building to where the six boxes were located, and Swain instructs them to remove the coating on the sixth one. One of the members, Blue, breaks away from the rest and begins inspecting the first box. Shortly after, Swain asks where Blue went, but the rest of the team seems confused, as if they never had a teammate named Blue, and they ask if everything's alright. The conversation is interrupted with the coding being removed, and Blue suddenly begins speaking over the comm system. Blue begins reciting the passage from the manuscript left by the O5 that led them here. He doesn't respond to Swain at all, and the rest of the team continues to remove the coding, also ignoring Swain's request to assist Blue. Blue finishes reciting the passage as the other two finally open the sixth box, finding another painted stone. The image on it depicts members of the civilization lined up outside of the lighthouse, with the closest ones appearing to be entering it. The two MTF members turn around at this point to find Blue standing completely still, and the color begins draining from his body. Within seven seconds, he becomes completely colorless, and then starting at the base of his feet, his body takes on a chalky, flaky appearance. 
one of the MTF steps forward and places a hand on Blue's shoulder, causing his body to collapse into a mound of ash. The effect quickly spreads to the other two, and the log ends. From then on, no personnel were allowed to travel to the island, but the site continued to operate to research remote containment procedures. Three days later, though, Director Swain was discovered to be missing, but a few more journal entries and multiple requests for additional personnel were found. The first journal entry reads, I can't believe I let Rosa walk like that. She was a good researcher, one with skill and potential. I think she knew that, though, and perhaps that scared her. Well, something scared her. There's nothing on this island, nothing I can look at and feel frightened by. It's peaceful. There's a calm stillness not found elsewhere, especially in my line of work. I looked at everything she did and felt the opposite. Maybe it's me who's blind to it all. Maybe there is something so vivid and so intense that my brain rolls over it. Rosa would be smart, then, and I'd be the fool. I examined the same rocks she did, and understood the same thing she had. What am I missing? There were people here once. They lived here. They worshipped a god who provided for them, a god who is now defunct, as are they. I guess I should have fought harder to keep her. Maybe I'd understand what she was so adamant about. Maybe I'd listen. Swain had submitted a request for a replacement for Rosa after she was transferred off, but the request was denied. Later, he submits another request, citing that anomalous activity has disrupted their already small team, many of them have been working overtime, and the lack of sleep is affecting everyone. This request was also denied. Another couple journal entries, which read, Emily had a breakdown earlier today. She kept begging me to forgive her. I'm losing my grip on this position. Nothing really prepares a person for something like this, to have everyone's lives and well-being placed in my hands, only for them to slip through my fingers drip by drip. Emily kept babbling about falling and a snake wrapping around her and squeezing her. I gathered everyone up after we had Emily sedated. We tried to think of an answer, but no one had anything. I told them that the lighthouse had turned on and they looked at me like I was crazy. No one else saw it, apparently. I showed them the video and they asked me where it was filmed. No one could find Joseph, either. The meeting went nowhere. Joseph thinks we triggered when we were forming the dig sites. We're looking into that whenever we can get to the island. The only consensus I can get is that we all feel like there's something or someone two inches behind us, but every time we turn around, they're gone. Like we're stuck in a dream unable to run away from the nightmare that's slowly gaining on us. I need more people. I need someone to help us stay sane and work through this. I sent our only protection to die today. I can't figure out if I'm to blame or the lighthouse. They'll never believe me when I say it. It's still watching me as I write this. Emily says I'm paranoid and that we're safe here. Are we safe anywhere near this godforsaken place? I had to abandon my men, and they were rendered to chalk, to ash, to nothing. Swain submitted yet another request for personnel, writing that they're all burnt out and cramped on the oil rig, and one of the team broke her leg due to the rogue wave, and she still isn't ready to work. 
He's not sure if Rosa talked to whoever is in charge of the transfers, but she was never in any real danger. He only let her transfer because he realized she was too out of her mind to get any work done if she stayed. Their only task force agents are gone, and until they get more personnel, the Foundation is putting their lives at risk. This request was also denied. There's one final personnel request submission, in which Swain seems to refer to himself in the third person. He asks if whoever is in charge knows what it's like on the site, and says that the non-essential personnel that he recently dismissed was the girl who broke her leg, and she was too hopped up on drugs to function. He angrily writes that the site has completely fallen apart, no one is allowed to transfer here because Rosa ran her mouth, and the higher-ups are sitting on their hands while the anomaly is becoming more dangerous, and researchers are getting injured and becoming feral, burnt-out creatures that work 100-hour weeks and drink more espresso than water. He writes that Swain can be found in his quarters working, eating, or sleeping, and he keeps the door locked in case the rest of the team stages a mutiny, which should happen pretty soon. He predicts that if no additional personnel are transferred, the Insurgency, or the Serpents, or Anderson, or anyone else that needs people familiar with anomalies is going to get some new recruits soon. Or maybe they'll just all be dead. He finishes by writing that they need more personnel, and it isn't a request, it's a demand. The status on this one is pending. Swain's final journal entry simply reads, I don't know what else to do. The following night, surveillance drones alerted Site Command that an unknown person had landed on the island, but any attempts to communicate with them failed due to the decay on the island and the persistent storm. After 12 minutes though, the person remotely connected with the site via a body camera. The person is, of course, Swain, and he's standing in front of the lighthouse. Emily, back on the site, asks him what the hell he's doing and tells him that he needs to come back now. Swain says that he had to see it, and that Rosa was right about it all. The people that lived here went into the lighthouse for some reason. Maybe it wanted them to, maybe it told them, but they loved it. Swain begins to look at the rotating light and stays silent for the next few minutes as Emily tries to converse with him. He finally says that he thinks about it a lot. They have these plants that are completely unnatural to this world, and these ruins which are an unnatural addition to this island, but the thing that was always here was this lighthouse. It's been the only thing watching this island and watching them. The light from the lighthouse seems to pause overexposing the camera feed. Swain says that the people who were here figured that out too, and they knew that it was only safe inside of it. A loud scraping sound is heard, and a large gap can be seen in the lighthouse's walls, with a pitch black interior. Swain says that you just have to understand that, and then it will accept you. He proceeds to enter the structure causing the feed to cut out for three seconds, before returning, showing him standing on a barren field as snow or ash rains from above him. The entirety of the expanse is in grayscale, and Swain begins to move forward silently, following multiple sets of footsteps. He says that he knew it. They left a path for them. He continues on for the next 14 minutes, reciting the passage from the manuscript to himself. Eventually he comes up to a massive tangle of vines and roots, a vivid brown in color. He says that it all makes sense, and that the poem was right. He really thought it was a warning, but it wasn't. Entwined within the massive bundle of roots are at least 200 corpses dressed similarly. 
they can all be seen slowly exhaling and inhaling in unison, with comparison of the footage showing that their breathing pattern corresponds to each rotation of the lighthouse's lantern. Swain approaches three bodies specifically, with identical clothes to the rest, but each bears the MTF insignia on their right biceps. Swain says that it wasn't a warning, because it wouldn't let anything else die on its watch. It stopped and conquered death. Swain begins to cry as he says that it, it took the island back and took their agents in order to save them. They woke it up and it wants to save him. He understands, as anything is better than the expanse, the not knowing, the struggle. They'll come and go and suffer in the process, while the ones here will remain as long as the lighthouse stands. He says, this is beautiful, and sees a more ornately dressed corpse at the center of the tangle, with a gray crown laying at the left of its head. He finishes by saying that this is our throne, and drops the camera. Sounds of stretching and slithering are heard, followed by the sound of tightening and wet movement. The feed continues for another three hours, with only the sounds of breathing heard. So, we have an island that draws people in in order to make them part of some sort of immortal hive mind cluster inside of a lighthouse. Except that the lighthouse and the island don't really force people to stay, but rather they invite people in that end up wanting to stay. There was nothing that prevented them from leaving the extra dimensional pocket, as we saw with Rosa, but the rest all willingly stayed there even as they were being pushed to the breaking point. Swain felt this pressure and futility more than any of them, due to him being in charge, and his repeated requests for assistance being denied by the Foundation. In the end, he saw the value in leaving behind this normal life of pain and suffering with no rewards, and willingly joined the Entity and the others that preceded him. There's still plenty of unanswered questions, including the fate of the rest of the personnel still on the site, but hopefully the rest of the Foundation finally gives them a break. <laughs>